you've made it to Cairo Hustle. Sit back and learn from the greatest influencers in the profession on the world's number one chiropractic podcast. Before we dive into this powerful episode, please remember to subscribe to our channels and to give us a five-star rating on iTunes to continue hustling. This episode is sponsored by Imaging Services, Cairo Health USA, Cairo Mobiles, Pure Cairo Notes, Titronics, Sherman College of Chiropractic, New Patients in a Box, The Influencer Authority Podcast Training, Mango Voice, Community Healthcare Resources, Life Chiropractic College West, Trackstat, and Msculpt. Let's hustle. Hey guys, welcome to episode 452 of the Cairo Hustle Podcast. I'm your producer, Luke Millette, and here's your host, James Chester. So today we have the opportunity of interviewing Dr. Didi Humber. And if you want to hear about a meaningful career in the history of chiropractic, stay tuned. Welcome back. This is another episode of the Cairo Hustle Podcast. It is episode 453. I almost said 553. I'm future pacing us here. Um, but today I have, uh, it's his birthday. So everybody that watches this, I uh, wish Didi Humber a, uh, a happy birthday. I won't, I won't let you all in on his age today. Maybe he'll do that, but um, he's been in the chiropractic profession now for, I believe, 64 years. Um, so if that says anything, he's 64. He, he started chiropractic at age one. Um, but bef- before we, we jump in and talk about his career and about chiropractic and the things he's been involved with from Dynamic Essentials to Life University to the Georgia Council for Chiropractic, um, I'm really, really inspired to have this this young man on my show today uh, because he's been uh, Sid Williams' uh, contributor to the, the historical resonance and the development of Life University. And there's a lot of great things that we're going to talk about today. But before we jump into the episode, I want to let everybody know the big why. Why do we do what we do over here at Cairo Hustle? Well, believe it or not, Freedom of speech is something that's really important to having medical freedom and family health freedom. And that's what Cairo Hustle does is our platform protects freedom of speech. There's never been one episode that we didn't air because somebody said something that I didn't agree with. So freedom of speech is important, especially for medical freedom and family freedom. Number two, um, we protect BJ Palmer's sacred trust with this show. And if you don't know what that is, go to your favorite search engine right now and go and look for what uh, B.J. Palmer's last words were. And he mentions this thing called the sacred trust. And then we also believe in subluxation-based chiropractic. Um, That's a big, significant uh, contributor to what chiropractic stands for. And then we believe in universal intelligence and innate intelligence, and that when somebody, uh, man or woman, gets adjusted, it connects them the physical to the spiritual. And with that being said, happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Welcome to the show. Great to be on. Yeah. You know, I, I just had one of your colleagues on the show today, uh, Chuck Gibson. And uh, I think it's uh, really impressive today. We can have a couple legends on our show. Thank you. Thank you. Been knowing that young man since Palmer days back in the <laughs> <laughs> So, you, 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 last time we chatted, you, you said that you grew up with uh, Sid Williams. We did. We uh, grew up in the same neighborhood, uh, southwest Atlanta, little area called Oakland City. And uh, Sid was like five and a half years uh, senior to me. But uh, I had a sister uh, who was his age. And uh, so I would hear her talk about Sid with a girlfriend that lived across the street from us. Uh, and Sid was a handsome young man. I, and uh, he, uh, the young lady across the street was rather smitten with him. But I remembered my sister talking about Sid Williams. And then I'd see him, even though he was older than I, I would see him uh, at our local park there in Oakland City. And then uh, later on, uh, the man that was right close to us there in Oakland City, lived close to where we were, 
his son played football at Tech High and Sid was there. And so <clears throat> my dad would go with his dad and I would tag along, see Sid play football at Tech High. <laughs> and then uh, Sid, uh, of course, got scholarships. So he had scholarship offers from 10 major college universities and then ended up choosing Georgia Tech right there in Atlanta. So, uh, uh, yeah, we've been knowing him basically uh, all our lives. Really, really impressive. And let's just talk a little bit about your career. I know we could probably talk for like 10 hours on this, but um, how did you get into chiropractic? Well, Jim, uh, two of my older brothers, uh, Dr. T.O. Umber, uh, was the first in. He was a lieutenant in the Air Force, stationed in Lubbock, Texas. And uh, his wife, Virginia, was expecting their first child. Uh, he, uh, she told him one day, she said, well, Orville, his name was T.O. Um, Orville, his middle name. She said, Orville, you're going to have to take me to the chiropractor here because I've got these back issues and I need help. And he said, listen, Virginia, we've got good medical care here on the base. It don't cost us a penny and no need to do that. <laughs> At any rate, she finally prevailed in and he took her to a Dr. Brookie Stevens there in uh, Lubbock. And, uh, uh, of course, she got wonderful care. And but he wouldn't even go in the office. He, 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 we came from medical background family, not that we had MDs in the family, but uh, never knew anything about chiropractic. So he was, he was uh, not happy with the fact she chose to go to the chiropractor. But uh, he would sit in the car and he'd keep seeing these people crawl in and walk out and he, he, he got interested and so he went in the office and uh, one day with Virginia she introduced him and he said well Lieutenant what are you going to do when you get out of service? He said I'm a pretty good salesman I'm going to sell insurance or real estate he said no you're not going to do that you need to you need to be a chiropractor you need to go to Palmer College in Davenport Iowa. so uh, when he got out of the service that's what he decided to do and uh, I've said many times, Brookie was, as most chiropractors should be today is, you don't necessarily uh, ask them, you just tell them where they ought to go. Uh, that, that would help build this profession up student recruitment-wise a lot if every chiropractor took that attitude Brookie had. But at any rate, T.O. went to Palmer first, and then my brother, uh, Kenneth, or J.K., followed him. So I had two brothers in chiropractic and uh, I was pretty sickly as a young teenager, stomach issues, headaches. And uh, so they told me, my mom take me to chiropractor there in uh, Atlanta and I did, uh, Dr. Grady Lake and uh, got great care. And then of course they encouraged me. Uh, back in those days, Jim, you could go straight to uh, Palmer out of high school. And uh, so that's what I did and enrolled in the 1052 class at Palmer and uh, uh, spent our time there and graduated. Actually, I took two summers off and spent uh, with Doc, uh, graduated with Dr. Sid and Nell in the spring of 56. So how old were you when you finished up chiropractic school? I was 23, 22. 22, 23. Well, yep. that's how, that you know. That's how it is down in Mexico. Right. Um, they they go straight from high school right into chiropractic school. Yeah. Well, back then there were a lot of lot of people at, at Palmer that were that way. Uh, we had older uh, people there. We had uh, I was one of the younger ones, but uh, we didn't have a ton of us. It was uh, in the you know I went there when I got to Palmer in the fall before uh, my birthday. In '52, I was just 18, turned 19, uh, just just shortly thereafter, and uh, so I took two summers off. As I mentioned, Sid and Nell, they came up. Uh, my brother T.O. he adjusted Sid. Sid had issues playing football at Tech, lost his athletic capabilities, and his dad recommended he go to a chiropractor. And he said, "You got to go to T.O. Umber. He just opened his office up here in our community." And so Sid did go and. Got such outstanding results after an atlas adjustment. He told Nell Kimbrough at that time, his fiance, he said, soon we 
get married, we're going to go to Iowa. For, I'm going to Palmer. And she said, if you're going, I'm going. So they both came up in the spring of 53. Um, and our, our relationship and friendship uh, continued from that time, too. So let me ask you, I'm sure that you had a chance to uh, um, at least see B.J. Palmer. Yes. Well, what are some of your, your memories of B.J.? Well, you know, uh, Sid and I used to talk about a lot of times. We, we'd see B.J. Uh, he was always up early every day. And when you got to class, B.J. had already beat you there. He was on campus. You see him walking under the clock out on, on Brady, there on top of Brady Hill, uh, and smoking that cigar. Always had a cigar. It looked like it was half used up every time I saw him. But anyway, uh, he was a smoker, and he'd be out there smoking that cigar and uh, checking out everything on campus. He, he uh, didn't leave any stone unturned. He was... He had beautiful gardens there uh, on campus. Uh, B.J. was uh, an unbelievable individual. I think even though most people hear about B.J., they don't realize, Jim, what a brilliant mind he was. And he was, he was, I say, I don't know, D.D. discovered chiropractic, but I don't know whether chiropractic would really survive if it hadn't been for B.J. Uh, he was tenacious. He was brilliant. Uh, he lived a perfect innate life, is all I can say. And uh, uh, it was a privilege to have been there and heard him. Uh, these stories, I don't know whether Dr. Gibson mentioned that to you or not, but uh, B.J., when we were there, he'd spend six months in Davenport, six months down in Sarasota in his home there on St. Armand's Key. But when he'd come up in the spring, he would uh, speak to the students uh, in the big room behind the, behind the B.J. Palmer Clinic, big, huge room, had all this memorabilia that he collected as he went around the world. He went around the world. He and uh, uh, his wife went around the world numerous times, and he was a big collector. And uh, he... Uh, but anyway, he would speak to us, and uh, uh, hearing him speak was un unreal. And and uh, he was he he was pretty uh, uh, well. Let's let's put it this way: when he said be there at a certain time, you weren't there, you didn't get in. Uh, we all always there at eight o'clock, and he'd be standing there with his little clock watch, and he'd see you, you could see coming down. Uh, the hall way there and if you didn't get there before that thing struck eight you didn't get in he shut the door in your face uh because he was serious business and he after he shut the door he walked straight up there and sit down in his chair and start talking uh but uh bj was uh and i'm gonna share this with your audience too because i feel like a lot of people wouldn't know this don't dwell too long on bj but I have to give him credit what credit's due. Uh, when I I went to Davenport, I was a member of uh, uh, Baptist Church, Tabernacle Baptist Church in Atlanta, and there was a fellow there named Marcus Bartlett, and he was uh, organist there at the church. Uh, so my first nine months up there, and I came home that first summer, uh, I was speaking to Marcus, and he said, well, how's Colonel Palmer? I had no idea he knew anything about Palmer other than that I'd gone to chiropractic college. I didn't know I'd have to be. And I said, you talking about B.J. Palmer? He said, yeah, Colonel B.J. Palmer. How's he doing? I said, well, he, he's doing fine, but how in the world would you know him? He said, Dury, that was my first name, D-U-R-I-E. He said, Dury. Everybody in broadcasting in the United States knows B.J. Palmer. I said, what? He said, he wrote the Bible. He wrote the Bible that every, you go into any radio, television station in the United States, they'll have one of Palmer's publications. He wrote the Bible for broadcasting. 
And I want to share that because I know a lot of people wouldn't uh, know about that. But I, I was so impressed. And uh, I've got a copy of one of his books. Uh, Dr. Mike Nathanson down in Florida uh, had a friend of his that uh, mentioned uh, BJ to him, said, I've got a book that he wrote. And he brought it and gave it to Mike and Mike sent it to me. Uh, and I've got it upstairs. Uh, I treasure that one of the BJ Palmer's broadcasting books, but he was known worldwide. I mean, across the United States, I don't know about worldwide, but across the United States, uh, he was known. Of course, he had, you know, radio stations and the TV stations. And, uh, so to have a career like he did in chiropractic and to be the, the, uh, developer of chiropractic and then at the same time, uh, do what he did in broadcasting. It, it's really kind of amazing. Yeah, you know, hearing your stories, it gives me a lot of, uh, you know, appeal right now because podcasting. Um, imagine if BJ Palmer had access to podcasting and YouTube oh and, <laughs> and social media. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, BJ, uh, of course, if you ever have a chance to get there on campus, you got to go through his home there. Uh, they take tours through there. Uh, he had a typewriter that he had it invented where he could, when he get up in the morning, if he'd wake up at 3.30 or 4 in the morning, he was up and get his, uh, his typewriter, he would say his innate providing, he'd start typing. And it, it was a roll thing where the, it was on a reel, and, and the paper never quit. It would just keep rolling. Uh, <laughs> So he didn't want to have to take time to stop and break up his chain of thought. And so he had that created where he had a continuous role to type on. And of course, you know, he wrote the green books that's so popular in chiropractic history. So let, let's talk a little bit about uh, more about your career. Um, you, you were at Life uh, University for 24 years, correct? Correct. What was it like for you to be a part of that? uh that movement and uh seeing that that school developed the way that it did well uh i'll paint the picture a little bit for you uh sid started dynamic essentials in november of 64 uh and uh of course i was there at the first meeting introduced him at the first meeting and had the privilege of introducing him to every other de meeting <laughs> throughout his life time uh i think maybe in the in the 57, eight years it's been, uh, I had the privilege of that, because uh, he, he's been gone now 12 years coming up, but uh, 10 years coming up. But uh, uh, I had the privilege of introducing him uh, all those years. But uh, we had a, because of DE, uh, we already had an alumni group of DE attendees. So when Sid, uh, and he talked with the Life Foundation trustees about starting a school, one day having a school, and we'd go look at locations, and he'd take us to different locations. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? Uh, he would plant those seeds, and he, he, never, never, he never rushed anything. I always take it uh, as it came. And so uh, 1974, May of 74, I got a call from him. He said, D.D. Nell and I over here in Marietta on Barclays Circle. I uh, saw an ad in the paper. This building is available if we want it. And I think it might be good for the school. Get in your car and come over here and let's take a look at it and see what you think. So uh, I was there with them the first day they have even laid eyes on the campus. Uh, and uh, so uh, ended up. Uh, of course, when the school started, uh, we were chartered in September of 74, and first class was January of uh, 75. It was 22 students, and uh, uh, I was still in practice. He wanted me to come out there full time, but I had to practice and have some income. He, he wasn't paying himself, couldn't have paid me. Uh, so I told him I can't come out there, and that's it. But at any rate, uh, uh, that was uh, that was the beginning. It was a it was a it was a it was a marvelous time to go through. And I look back on it, uh, the experience that I enjoyed because every I, I enjoyed every day, every minute. Uh, put a lot of time and effort into it, but uh, 
uh, what a privilege it was mine to have been uh, sort of Sid's right-hand man and supporter through the years of his vision. Uh, and uh, I was first chairman of the board there. And, but once I went to life and, it, and became an uh, employee there, of course, you can't be a trustee uh, and be employed by the university. So, uh, but I was trustee at the beginning of the school for the first three years. And then in September 78, I went out and uh, was there for 24 years. You've made it to Cairo Hustle. Sit back and learn from the greatest influencers in the profession on the world's number one chiropractic podcast. This episode is sponsored by Imaging Services, Cairo Health USA, Cairo Moguls, Pure Cairo Notes, Titronics, Sherman College of Chiropractic, New Patients in a Box, The Influencer Authority Podcast Training, Mango Voice, Community Healthcare Resources, Life Chiropractic College West, Trackstat, and Emsculpt. Let's hustle. So that's something I did not know. And being in the chiropractic profession the way that I am today, um, I did not know that Dynamic Essentials came before Life University. Yeah, 10 years before. Um, so... Tell us what dynamic essentials means and why it's significant to the chiropractic profession. Well, uh, you know, uh, dynamic essentials, uh, even though chiropractors come there, men and women come to attend DE and have through the years uh, to gain six, uh ideas and things that they can utilize to build their practice just like any other motivational program uh but de was really more than that and sid wanted to expand not only the concept of chiropractic success but individual success by teaching the the uh, people attending de how to get rid of the ego their ego, get them, set themselves aside and start living an innate life by freeing up uh, themselves of any baggage or, or negative thoughts that they might have of lack of success in that type of thing. And so uh, a lot of the, a, a lot of GE is, is self, personal self-development of turning yourself over to the innate lifestyle and allowing innate your innate messages to come through spend the quiet time uh, at de we'd have sessions and sid had sessions of uh, of uh, uh, quiet time with uh, uh, the the uh, uh, 49 breaths that he used to do on the regular we still do that we have people in our at de today and go to quiet time, quieting yourself down, getting yourself, allowing, allowing, allowing yourself to allow the innate thought flashes to come through. Because that's what, you know, that's what BJ, when I was talking about him a while ago, and BJ doing all that, when he get up early in the morning, in his quiet time, he would write everything that came to him at that time. So there was no ego. A lot of people used to say he had ego, and so Sid had ego. They pushed that ego aside that, and, and allow innate to speak to them. And that really directed their life. And so Sid liked to carry that message forward as, as well as having step-by-step -step procedure uh, uh, as a part of the DE uh, program through the years. And I, I'll add this too. Uh, you know, we came, uh, when we started, uh, Sid started DE, we came out of school in the 50s and, uh, and then even into the 60s when Sid started DE, uh, it was a challenge being a chiropractor because all you hear in those days were negative uh, information coming out in magazines, newspaper articles, radio, television, whatever. It, you never got anything positive. It was all negative. Uh, of course, the AMA was after chiropractic, wanted to eliminate chiropractic, and had a committee on quackery set up, and uh, they loved to put that name out, so chiropractic. And so chiropractors in the 60s really had been beat down. There was five states that still didn't have licensure. Uh, 
And when we graduated, and uh, of course in '73, Louisiana was the last state to be licensed. But uh, but chiropractors, they had a lot of negativity they had to get over, and, and a lot of that negativity hung on and prevented them from being successful. <laughs> they didn't know what their capabilities were. They were so beat down with all this negative. They've gotten their degree, gotten their license, but they were struggling. And so they'd come to DE, and it was like a, a, a spiritual awakening for them to be uplifted and sit talking about the positive aspects of chiropractic and, and what you can do as a chiropractor if you just turn yourself over, get rid of your ego, and, and uh, become a real true servant in chiropractic. Uh, and so uh, chiropractors would go back home like they'd been free and uh, <laughs> all of a sudden got freedom and uh, built strong practices. And of course, uh, back then, uh, insurance, uh, very little insurance and, and chiropractors, of course, they'd x-ray and the mate first charge was a pretty good chunk. Back in those days, you had to pay for the in, uh, x-rays and so one of the things that Sid came up with he said shuck the x-rays hardly cost anything if that's a barrier keeping people out shuck let's just give them the x-rays if they'll get in get under chiropractic care and experience chiropractic uh, that's what we need to do and so we became branded or he did back in the early days being the free x-ray seminar uh but that opened up a market and uh uh, allowed chiropractors to do that. And the Life Foundation that Sid started, uh, Service Education and Research, we would actually uh, take funds from that and buy x-ray film. And uh, shucks, I would take it and mail it to chiropractors all over uh, that they needed film for. That was part of the program. And so, and they would advertise that these x-rays had been donated. And so we'd donate them to you, the, the, the patient. Uh, so you don't have to pay us for the x-ray. And so, uh, but that was some of the early days, but trying to trying to get through and beyond uh, the negativity that the medical profession, the AMA primarily was throwing at us at the time was a real challenge. But self-development, uh, living innate lifestyle uh, was a major part and has been through the years a part of Dynamic Essentials. So I'm curious. I'm sure you have your own visions and views, but where do you see the beautiful profession of chiropractic heading? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, I'd like to give uh, a positive statement about it. You know, if you look from where we were and where we are today, you can say, boy, chiropractic has really come a long way, and it has. There's no question about it. There's so many good things that have happened to bring us to where we are. But we're sort of at the time and I've, I've been doing a lot of talking lately about that and been doing a lot of research uh, about that aspect. And right now, uh, we have approximately uh, 10,000 students in our chiropractic institutions. And so about every year, we get a, a graduating class. So you, you, you're turning out uh, about 1,000. And, and in the last 20 years, uh, We've only grown from like 60,000 to 70,000. I'm talking about just here in the state now. We've got chiropractors around the world, but here in the state. And so, uh, you know, if we're going to grow, see, we back in the <laughs> back in the day when, and I want to use that term, but back in the 20s and back in the 30s, chiropractic was brand new. Chiropractors would get patients, and there was no no barriers. There was no. It was before negativity came about from AMA. They they were having a hard time making their own profession uh, grow. Uh, so in the early days, the chiropractors then, those early pioneers, they were free. And in the flu epidemic, shucks, if it hadn't been for chiropractic, chiropractic had a tremendous impact on. Uh, the, uh, 1918 flu epidemic and it it it, it was uh back then people would come in with every kind of uh, ailments that you could think of and uh, chiropractic would adjust them and they'd go back and they'd tell their friends and that's how chiropractic started growing back in those days uh, but today's situation we 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 basically uh in so many areas of our uh 
profession have gotten away from the true principle of chiropractic. Uh, I don't want to put out, you know, when the AMA, uh, AMA, ACA, uh, was able to get their crediting group approved by U S department of education, uh, CCE was formed and over the years, I can tell you for a fact that the whole approach to that program and the standards that's been developed through the years has been to develop the practitioner where they are, quote, well-educated in the sciences, which is basically the medical model, and we follow that medical model through CCE and through broad scope laws in the states. And so today, a person going to a chiropractor, you never know who they go. They can go to a chiropractor today and never get adjusted. And that's been going on for a long time. It hadn't just started. I'm talking about probably for the last 20 years. You hear patients come in and said, uh, oh, what are you doing? I, I, I never experienced that. I went to chiropractor. They didn't do that. They put this, they laid me on this table and put this hot pack on me. They laid it on me, put this galvanic on me. They did whatever. And, and so we actually, the innate, <laughs> the freeing of the vital life force within through the correction of vertebral subluxation is the basis of chiropractic. And as a profession, that has become almost uh, it's just such a small segment of the chiropractic profession. One major reason for that is money. Chiropractors found out if they could add services, they could charge for them and the insurance would pay for them. And so we got to the point where uh, broad scope laws were passed for that purpose. And so what chiropractors started doing, they, they were trying to take care of themselves, Jim, instead of the public. The public is what needs to benefit from chiropractic. And uh, way back, I hate to go on so long with this but uh you know there was a segment in our profession it was all about image image making ourselves look uh educated making ourselves look uh like we want to quote fit in because if we can just do that we'll gain uh access to various levels of our society if we'll just if we'll just go that route and then they'll respect us for our education and they'll expect that they'll respect us uh 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 for not uh for not uh talking about any philo philosophical aspects of the practice and so uh you asked the question about the future uh my challenge to the chiropractic profession and to chiropractors in general is if you can't, if you, if you as a practitioner, if we don't as a profession get back to the basics of what Palmer, Palmer laws of life, and that's what really built, you know, that's what Sid, he, he said, that's what we're going to develop. We're going to develop Palmer laws of life. It's going to be a part of chiropractic at Life University. And so that's one reason life grew so fast. But we had alumni from the DE people. But uh, the challenge today, if we're going to ever grow like we need to, as a service organization of, pr of principal practitioners, we need to expand the knowledge of what we do, not what, what we can do to allow any ability of the body to heal itself. How many people think that, how many people on the, uh, today uh, think that the body heals itself that concept alone we ain't even push that we, we, we don't want to push that uh that the body heals itself but if people stop to think about it so we got to start educating if we're going to su survive in the future and grow and that's where resp our responsibility to carry this growth not for the chiropractor's benefit 
not for the profession's benefit, but to expand the discovery that B.J. Palmer made in 1895. That was a new thought, a new concept. And that has to be expanded if we're going to succeed in the growth. And the losers in this is not us as professionals. It's the people who die every day for the lack of correction of verbal subluxation. So two questions. Do you have a few more minutes? Yes. Um, how does it make you feel when you hear somebody say chiropractic medicine and when you see that on the new graduate's diplomas? Well, that's an oxymoron. <laughs> chiropractic medicine, there is no such thing as it. It's chiropractic and it's medicine. And we all, you know, that little slogan that we came up with, I can't remember where it came from, but uh, chiropractic first, medicine second, surgery last, that's a perfect, we, there's a whole lot in medicine today that we, we know medicine, we, can't, we don't want to do without medicine. We love medicine. The part of medicine that saves lives, we love that, the aspects of medicine. That, that, that'll be here from now on, and thank goodness for that. But it's chiropractic first. Find out if these people have interference to their body's nervous system because that's where the cause is. If you can find that out, and they are a chiropractic patient, discover if they are chiropractic patients, and then you set out to correct any interference to the nervous system. That's chiropractor's role. That's what we're here to do. That doesn't mean that we're dummies and don't pay any attention to any other body functions or referral or whatever. But, uh, uh, you know, that the message is the body is a self-healing organism. And chiropractic is a separate and distinct science, art, and philosophy. Always has been, always will be, whether, whether it's presented that way or not. So, being on both chiropractic holy grounds down Port Iowa and Marietta, Georgia. Right. What does it mean for you when you hear the saying, there's nothing bigger than life? Well, nothing bigger than life. <laughs> That's true. True, tr true life is full 100% expression of the life force within the body. The body's ability to heal itself uninterfered with in any aspect that's that's what it's all about the body healing itself and all we are all we are is we like to, we clear the channels through chiropractic adjustment and you say well you know chiropractors say well so-and-so had sciatica so-and-so had headaches or so -and -so. i gave them adjustment and it didn't do any good well man listen you you get that patient under cover. That's the other thing, Jim. We we don't we don't quote. I hate to use this term, but sell lifetime care. Chiropractic is not a thing where you go in to get a treatment like a pill and take these pills for a, a month or two months, and then you should be better. Chiropractic is lifetime care. It needs to be introduced that way. When the patient comes in, they need to be told or informed and educated on the fact of, number one, how it can make a difference in their life and the, their, their family's life if they would avail themselves to chiropractic care as a lifetime approach. I can tell you for a fact that at 89, uh, my birthday today, and I don't know where I would be. I know one thing that uh, I I get around. Uh, Beth tells me all the time, "You the you the youngest eighty nine year old I've been married to." But it's she because you know I get around well. I do, but I I attribute all of mine to number one the Lord, and then number two chiropractic care and staying clear. We Beth and I have a standard appointment with our chiropractor here in Brunswick. It's across the causeway in Brunswick, Georgia. Every two o'clock, every Tuesday, we are there to get checked and we adjust it. Whether if, if we need it, we adjust it. If we find it, we're holding, that's fine. We're tickled about that. But we get checked every week. If every person in this country could have their spine examined and corrected and then keep it that way, 
I'm telling you, the difference in the lives of public is be absolutely amazing. It is to us. And uh, that's that's the future. It, it's future is in lifetime care. I like to say from first breath to last breath, from cradle to grave, from womb to tomb. Amen. And uh, it's uh, it's something that you get to have instead of what you have to do. And yeah. uh, chiropractic is not an expensive Advil. And, yeah. uh, you know, I think that one of the things I always bang a drum on is if we don't tell them the truth about chiropractic, someone else will uh, convert them into drugs or surgery. And I think as, as the closing today, um, I just want to thank you so much for being our guest today on episode 453 of the Cairo Hustle podcast and talking about the history of chiropractic and uh, talking about your life with Sid and your memories of BJ. And uh, I believe that this episode will go down as one of my favorites just because I, I just love the, the stories that you shared with me today and the amount of truth that you hold for the principle of chiropractic. Thank you, Jim. Pleasure to be on, and uh, maybe we can do it again sometime in the future. I look forward to that day, and uh, I want you to have a happy, happy birthday, and uh, give give Beth a big hug, and uh, looking forward to seeing you soon. Okay. Thank you, my friend. God All bless. Right. God bless. Bye for now. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks for listening to Cairo Hustle. Don't forget to subscribe and check back next week to continue hustling.